Do you struggle with making resolutions every year that you're going to get organized this year and then it never happens? Well, you're in luck because today we are continuing our discussion about organizing tips and mantras to help you reach your organizing goals here on Get Organized with Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Granock. I'm a certified professional organizer with over 15 years in the field. And did you know that January is known as Go Month? The Go stands for Get Organized. And whether you're watching this in January or any other time of the year, making the resolution to get organized can be tricky if you don't have some tools in your pocket. And so in this three-part video series, we are talking about organizing tips and mantras that can help you tackle any organizing project. So this is part two in our series. And if you missed the first video, you can look over here and click on this uh, link here to watch part one as well. So this is part two. And in our first video, we talked about tips and mantras that will help you before you even start your organizing project. So of course, for this video, we're going to talk about what to do during an organizing project. So tips and mantras that will help you right when you're in the middle of working on an organizing project. So we're up to tip number six. And this is questions that you can ask yourself. So we know when we are working on an organizing projects that we're looking for the things that we want to keep versus the things that we're ready to let go of or get rid of. And sometimes this is pretty obvious. Oh, I definitely want this or oh, I don't want this anymore. But sometimes we're like, eh, we're kind of on the fence. So if you find yourself on the fence about some objects, you're not sure what to do with them. Here are some questions that you can ask yourself. The first one is, do I need it? Now we covered this in our very first mantra in the first video. When I say, do I need it? I mean, does it serve my current life right now? The second question is, do I love it? Not, you know, I inherited it or someone gave it to me as a gift and I feel obligated to keep it, but do I love this item? Are there legal or financial reasons why I need to keep it? I mean, I don't love my mortgage paperwork, but you know, I keep it. And the fourth question you can ask yourself when you're stuck is what is the worst thing that would happen if I let this go? There's a famous saying that if you can replace something in less than 20 minutes for less than $20, don't sweat the small stuff. All right, here's a mantra that's great when you're thinking about whether to keep things or not. If everything is special, nothing is special. Now I see this a lot with people who have, let's call them collections. You know, it may start off innocently enough. You go somewhere and, and you see this cute little cow figurine and you're like, oh, that's really cute. And before you know it, all your friends and family who have seen your cute little cow figurine think, well, she loves cows. And so everybody's buying you cow things. Um, and now you've got hundreds of them in your house. So think about this mantra and make purposeful choices. Because if you reduce the number of items you're keeping, then you can have them stored and displayed in a more honorable, beautiful way. So this is a photo of a shadow box that my husband made, and there's a story behind it. So my husband had inherited a couple boxes of items that belonged to his grandfather. And at first he felt like, well, I should just keep everything in these boxes because they belong to my grandfather and to get rid of them is to get rid of him essentially. And that is not the case. Remember, these are objects that they are not your, your family member or your loved one, even though they may be associated with them. And what was happening is my husband was keeping these boxes in the basement. So he couldn't even enjoy any of these items of his grandfather. He just had the box and would have, you know, guilt feelings if he would see the box. That doesn't seem like a great way to honor somebody 
in my opinion. So what we did instead is we went through the boxes and my husband looked for items that meant something to him about his grandfather, something he could tell a story about with each item. So he chose a few items such as a fishing lure because he had enjoyed going fishing with his grandfather and fishing became a hobby that he also now enjoys as an adult. His grandfather's military dog tags, and there were lots of stories he had heard from his grandfather about serving in World War II. A bolo tie that has to do with their, you know, growing up in New Mexico. And again, it's something that not only was passed down, but something, you know, that became an item of clothing that my husband enjoyed as well. So you see where I'm going with this. So each object has a story behind it and a memory and you can look at it and have good feelings. And so he took these items, went to a framing store and was able to make a shadow box that displayed these particular items. Well, this has now become a piece of artwork within our home and it's a conversation piece and it's a chance to reminisce and tell stories and keep the memory of his grandfather alive versus never looking at it because it's sitting amongst lots of other things he doesn't have a connection with in just a random box in the basement. So if everything is special, nothing is special. Find a way to honor a few key pieces and then display it. Store it where you use it. So when you're trying to decide what to do with the items that you are going to keep, you want to store things where you use them based on the frequency of use. So the more you use something, the more accessible it should be. So this is a picture of my entryway in my home. We have this um, pegboard, basically a uh, hook board on the wall. Right when I walk it in the front door, it's the first thing I see. It's a, ch it's a chance for me to put away my keys, um, a mask, a hat, umbrella. I never have to look for these items because that is their home. So as soon as I come home, that's where they go. When I'm ready to leave the house, I know exactly where to look for these things. I'm never late because I couldn't find my keys. I'm not saying I'm never late, but I never look for my keys. Next mantra is go tall and use the wall. So if space is at a premium, don't forget that you can go vertical. Instead of storing things on a shelf or a drawer, you could add a shelf, for example, to an existing wall instead of a shelf in a closet. Use vertical storage as much as possible because it will give you more options for organizing solutions. And when you go tall, you are using up less space than something that might be shorter and wider. So this little girl had a bunch of stuffed animals and they used to be all over the floor and all over her bed. So they were not vertical. They were horizontal, right? And they were taking up a lot of space, but by getting this, um, this is a, an organizing product that Ikea makes and it comes in different colors. She was able to, um, her mother was able to attach it to an existing rod which you can see up there. And we were able to display her stuffed animals, but in a way that was taking up a lot less space. And then she had more play area in her bed and on the floor. Number 10, done is better than perfect. So this, this is similar to one that we talked about in our previous video about just start, but just get it done. There's always time to go back and tweak things later. So sometimes what stops people, which you talked about in our first video, is looking for this magic pocket of time to get it all done so they never start. But this is kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Sometimes people 
delay working on an organizing project because, or they linger with it because it's not perfect. I got to wait until I have the perfect thing. No, just get it done. You can always go back and tweak it later. So this was a kitchen uh, organizing project I did with a client. And when you talk about store it where you use it, so you can see she's got some fancier glassware up on the top shelf of the cabinet versus having snacks, which she uses all the time, the family uses every day. She has those easily accessible on the counter. So when I say you can always go back and tweak it later, these were baskets and bins that she already had. So she can always go back if she wants to be matchy matchy or a little more cutesy. If she wants to get a specific kind of bin or basket, it's a certain color scheme or certain style. Sure, you can go back and tweak it later, but she has organized this space and it is functional and it is working for their family. This is anchoring a space. So this is a subliminal type of organizing trick. Um, I know it's hard to see brown on brown, but what we have here is a medium brown dresser drawer in a girl's bedroom. And on top of the dresser is a shallow open box in a darker brown color. So consider open shallow boxes because you can store smaller items in them the idea is that you are subliminally saying you can't just make the top of this dresser a drop zone. It has to have a purpose. All these items are related to each other in the sense that they're kind of trinkets or, you know, cute items, but they're not randomly placed all over the dresser, which could encourage other things to be dropped there. They are contained within a purposeful box. So it looks like, okay, this is a box for decorative items. It doesn't mean you get to drop other random things all over the dresser. So it's a subliminal thing that you can do to anchor a space and prevent it from becoming a clutter drop zone. I encourage you to visit organizingmagic.com for more organizing resources, including our free e-newsletter, and information about our monthly Zoom webinars, which are also free. And remember that new videos drop every Friday. So be in the know and click like and subscribe before you go so you never miss a single video. I'll see you next time.